All right, good morning. morning. Welcome to Barnesville Baptist here on the first Sunday of May. It's good to have everyone here, both online, and we welcome everyone uh, in person as well. Uh, a few announcements to get us started. Uh, first, we have, I want to welcome a, a new preacher. Uh, he's coming from Delaware. I think it's his first time preaching, so please, you know, make him welcome. Introduce yourselves. Uh, we're glad to have Randy and, and Sandy back. So we're, uh, Randy and Sandy will be uh, with us three times this summer, so we look forward to having them. Somehow, Randy... Uh, already got scheduled to be here on the same day as the church picnic so i don't know how that worked out uh but we'll yeah we're glad to have uh our good friends uh randy and sandy back with us uh th this morning uh next week uh reverend mark adams a uh, uh, retired pastor from redland baptist will be here to preach um let's see i think that's all the major announcements so it's time for our monthly uh, pass the search committee update to the church. So uh, let me share with you what we've been doing in the last month. So the search committee met twice in the month of April. Uh, the pa our pastor position notice was published on April 9. It has been posted on our Facebook page and it has been shared with the Montgomery Baptist Association, the Baptist Convention of Maryland, Delaware, and the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, so the, our ad, our position notice has been in either a newsletter or a job search page format. We've also sent the position notice to Southern and South, Southeastern seminaries uh, in our Southern Baptist family as well as Liberty University. Uh, we have already begun to receive several resumes and indications of interest. Uh, the deadline to submit applications is June 15, so we're basically uh, in a waiting uh, period. So continue to pray that the right man that God has already selected will submit his application. So while we are waiting to receive all those applications uh, by mid-June, the search committee is developing an application evaluation form as a tool uh, to grade and evaluate each candidate's entry uh, cons in a consistent way as we review the applications this summer. The search committee will also be, be preparing additional questions to ask as we further narrow down the list of candidates to those we will interview in person. So in many ways, we are still at the beginning of the process. Uh, we will continue to have a variety of pastors uh, preaching uh, this summer, but uh, Michael Trammell will be doing an extended series of Sunday preaching starting on July 7th for about five weeks. So that is our update. Again, if anyone has questions or, or would like to know more information about the process, I'm happy to chat with you at any time. So, Nita. Good morning, church family, here and online. Uh, before we start our worship through song, I'd like to thank uh, Reverend Randy and his wife Sandy for singing with our choir today. They're getting assimilated with our church really quickly, I would say. <laughs> um, First Chronicles 16.10 says, Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. The choir will now lead us in our call to worship.
Revelation 19, 6 space says, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Ephesians 3, 19, be filled with all the fullness of God. From his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. John 1, 16. 2 Peter 3, 18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Amen. Let us continue to grow spiritually by learning more about Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ, about his amazing love for us, his atoning sacrifice for us, and his teachings for us. Join me as we sing number 564, More About Jesus. For whatever is born of God conquers the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Who is it that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? In Romans 3.25, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. As our hymn says, O glorious victory that overcomes the world. Let's rejoice in singing number 521, Faith is the Victory. Let us stand.
Would you pray with me? Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love and kindness and blessings that you shower upon us. Uh, we thank you for your, your, your mercy, and we especially thank you for your son who, who died on the cross uh, for our sins and was risen, uh, that we too may uh, live forever. Uh, we pray uh, here just a couple days after the National Day of Prayer for our country. Uh, we pray for our community. Uh, we pray for the families that we know, our friends and our neighbors. We ask that in th these days that are so often uh, covered with trouble and, and, and difficulty and conflict, that you would be our Prince of Peace, that people would, would look to you uh, for their problems, for their issues. Uh, because we know that only through you can we have true and ultimate peace. And so we ask a blessing on, on, on this entire world, uh, on our nation, on, on the many nations around us that we know are in conflict, for our own country, uh, as, as we struggle through so, so many issues, we ask for your blessings, your wisdom, your truth, so that all good things would be in order in your will. And we lift up the prayer that your son taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, glory forever. Amen. Would you join me now with our responsive reading uh, that is available up on the wall in, the, in the, your bulletin. It comes from John chapter 6, verses 32 through 40. Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, church. Good morning. Welcome everyone here. Welcome everyone online. Uh, glad to have you worshiping with us today. Um, just a couple of things. In prayer request, just remember, uh, we have several who are who are sick and needing some uh, he, need Lord's healing. Uh, Linda's still in the hospital, but she's doing better. Uh, Margie is in rehab, but uh, struggling with some pain. Um, Dot is, needs our prayers. Her and her family. Um, things are going on in her health. Um, we just ask you to continue to pray for them and many others in our uh, our uh, church family that uh, that need your prayer. So I'm just going to have a quick word of prayer. And also, uh, Tandy mentioned Nancy Wells is uh, was diagnosed with lung cancer. So pray for her also, former member. 
Dear Lord, we just come now to give our petitions to you, Lord. We lift up those names that we just talked about and others that others are that you've laid on others' hearts to, to pray. We just ask your hand to be upon them. Continue to uh, watch over them and their families. Restore their health. Lord, we just ask your blessing to pour down on them. Give them your peace and your understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so thank you. Um, time for offering. You can certainly give on, give it through the plates today and here. Also give online. Um, I know they said some things might be changing online, so if you have any issues online, let me know. Um, making a payment, but uh, or making making your offering, not a payment. But uh, uh, sorry, 28 years in the mortgage business, pay payments. Everybody makes me payments. So, uh, um, but uh, giving your generously giving your offering, giving back to the Lord online, so, or here in person. So, Ed, if you come and please. Let us pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, awesome God, what a glorious day you've given us. We thank you for the many blessings on our homes and our family. We thank you for Barnesville Baptist Church. We thank you for Reverend Randy Gilliam and his wife Sandy. We thank you for all that is that have attended and those that are watching online. We thank you for every good and perfect gift that you've given us. Now, Father, we give back to you a portion of everything you've given us in our tithes and offers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jan, that was lovely. Please rise for our doxology. Good morning, everyone. I'm a little nervous this morning because Pastor Randy is over there watching me. 
And he's a little nervous because he never knows what I'm going to say. Again. But I don't have any worms or bird or fishes or anything like that this morning. I just have a story for you. Have you ever been to an indoor flea market? Do you know what it is? They don't sell fleas there. No. They, uh, they're quite large, some of them. A lot of people have tables set up and they're selling stuff, all kinds of stuff. You can find just about anything you can imagine there. There are usually lots of people buying and selling almost everything you can imagine. It can be quite chaotic with noise and everyone rushing around trying to find a bargain. My story today is about Jesus and the temple. Do you remember how Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey and all the people were so excited? It put the whole town into an uproar. Well, after Jesus got there, he went to the temple to pray. Matthew 21, 12, and 13 tells us what Jesus must have saw when he got there. It probably looked like a giant flea market with tables set up and people buying and selling all kinds of stuff. They even were selling pigeons. They even had tables set up for money changers. Jesus must not have been very happy with what he saw. The scripture tells us that Jesus drove all the people that were buying and selling stuff they are out of the temple. Then he turned over all the stools and tables and said to them, It is written in the scriptures that God said, My temple will be called a house of prayer, but you have made it into a hideout of thieves. So what can we learn from that? We know we don't have flea markets inside our church. Can you imagine coming through the front door of church and seeing an indoor flea market going on with everyone buying and selling almost everything? Even pigeons flying around? There goes one now. Don't look up. <laughs> but what about, what about inside our bodies? Paul wrote in Corinthians 6.19, Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and who has given you, who's get, was given to you by God? You don't belong to yourself, but to God. He bought you for a price. So use your bodies for God's glory. Did you know that God uh, considers each of us a temple? He does. Have you ever heard someone say, dance like nobody's watching? <laughs> or sing like nobody's listening? I think that's why some people sing in the shower. Well, Jesus is watching and listening all the time. He knows what is in our hearts and everything about us. Just like the woman Jesus met at the well. He knew everything about her, even though he had never met her before. John 4.29 says the woman went back to town and said, Come see the man who told me everything that I've ever done. Isn't it amazing how Jesus knows everything that we've ever done? He wants us to focus on him and not be all helter-skelter like a flea market. He wants us to pray and keep in, in our hearts all the time. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, creator of all things, help us to remember that your Holy Spirit is within all of us. You created each of us. Be mindful of what you want us to focus on and keep you in our hearts all the time. We ask this in Jesus, our Lord and Savior's name. Amen. <laughs> We're, we are very happy to have Randy and Sandy back with us. Um, thankful they sang in the choir. They just picked up right where they left off, you know, like 10 years ago almost. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Rand, Randy and Sandy came. Last time we had a real full pastor search committee. We, we plucked Randy to be our associate pastor. And, and then he eventually became our full-time pastor, serving here over 14 years. So, uh, uh, we're very thankful every time that they they find their way back to Barnesville, and, and we're very thankful that you'll be coming several more times this summer, and uh, we're, we're always grateful to have you guys here, and we're excited to hear Randy preach. So, uh, Randy? Preach. He did find the clock. <laughs> oh, 
Uh, you remember how I defined briefly? <laughs> the message will be brief. Brief is defined as it'll it'll be exactly as long as it takes to finish what I prepared. <laughs> so it won't be a, it won't be a long message. And it, I, these songs that you sang this morning are about the Lord Jesus, and that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. But I, I thank you, David. It's good for us to be here. This is like family to us. And I think I know every single person here except perhaps the Belchers. I haven't met them before. And uh, it's just great to see you, Luke and, and uh, David and Ann and Nita and Jan. Jan, what was the name of that prelude song you did? We were listening to the melody. And couldn't, we couldn't think of the name. Hidden of Adoration, that's what it was. It's a beautiful song. It's always good to be here, and I'm very grateful. By I, I watch you folks online sometimes. We were recently in Colorado and watched your uh, last Sunday with uh, Tom Stoll, and then uh, before that I got to see Mike Trammell. You've had some really good preachers here, so don't, <clears throat> don't compare us, because these are really good preachers. <laughs> Uh, John Hauger, Dr. Hauger, was an associate professor at uh, Southern, and I had, a, had, him, had him for an independent study class. And Mike Trammell and Pam belong to the church we attend in uh, Fenwick Island. They're great people. He's a great friend. And um, we thank the world of Tom Stoll. We knew him when he was the uh, business manager and treasurer for the convention. And he's a wonderful man, a very humble man. And we're so pleased that he's now the executive director of the Maryland Delaware Convention. So you've had some uh, some good pastors uh, to come here and preach. And Mark Adams is coming. He's excellent. So you'll like these guys. Um, what everything changes. I know that. Um, all the preachers that have been here, from my experience, first in this church with Horace DuBois and Edith right up through Pastor Danny, the message has never changed over the church. The message of this church, 153 years, remains the message, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we can't change that. I was really bothered in Tom Stoll's message last week when he said that 43% um, of self-identified evangelicals do not believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. And I think, what do they do? What what do they do at church? Why is there a church if there's not Christ? And so the message is simply John 3.16. That has been used here. It's been used since Jesus said it himself. It's a message that goes across every national boundary, every ethnic group, every language group. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That is the message. Paul said in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart God will raise, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what the church preaches. That's why we assemble to worship the risen Savior. And then Paul said in 5, Romans, 1 Corinthians 15, 13, for I delivered you first of all that which I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, that he was buried and he rose the third day according to the Scriptures. Don't ever let another gospel come into your church. You're seeking a pastor. The Lord is preparing somebody for this church, for this ministry, and you, you need to pray about it and pray for your search committee. Pray for all those resumes that come in. Pray for God's man to come here. Don't ever change the gospel. I say to a lot of people about Barnesville Baptist Church, this is a small church, but it casts a long shadow. It has had a good reputation in the convention ever since Horst de Boy. He was the recording secretary for the convention for several years in the 50s. It has had um, ministry... DNA, part of its DNA is missions. Ever since Edith the Boy and uh, Lottie Moon and Annie Armstrong, we've been very, this church has been very almost sacrificially given to missions. 
and benevolence, helping people. Um, and recently, uh, you've been live streaming to folks not just in this community, but uh, outside this community. Who knows where they go, where the message is heard. And I also understand that you've live uh, streamed Bible study into Pakistan. That's an amazing thing. This church, this little church on the hill, has a, cast a long shadow for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm certain in my own mind that because of your commitment to missions and benevolence and prayer, the Lord will continue to bless you here in the ministries that you have given. And I'm very excited about that. Well, everything changes. Your pastors change. Everything changes. In fact, the changes in our physical world happen so quickly, it's breathtaking. Uh, it's unimaginable the things that happen now, that go on now, that we would never have dreamed as recently as five years ago. And we know from experience, everything physical wears out. Uh, my dad didn't believe that. My dad is, I've told you this before, he would take an old lawnmower or an old outdoor outboard motor and look at it and he says, it will run, run as well as it ever did. Well, no, it doesn't. It gets old. <laughs> it gets dirty. It, it wears out. Everything wears out. Uh, I made a decision for the Lord here in this room in 1954. I was 10 years old. Now I'm 80. Things change. We wear out. We get tired. We, we forget things. You know, it happens to all of us. We're all in that boat. I remember uh, Brother Ralph said to me one day here, he said, when I got older, I thought I would know everything. And he said, and I agree with him now, the older we get, the more we understand that we don't know. There are a lot of things we do not know. Our cars change, our roads change, our telephone communication technology is incredibly different than it has ever been. I was thinking of my grandmother, uh, Mary Krause, born in 1884, horse and buggies. In her lifetime, we landed a man on the moon. I mean, that's incredible change. And it has sped up even since then. It's incredible. Now we have to deal with not only smartphones and iPads, computers, but with AI, artificial intelligence. Um, I had an experience uh, a couple of weeks ago in a Bible study in our church. A young man who's participates in it, said in the meeting that he had seen a video of David Jeremiah say that he had found new proof that the Lord was coming back in 2024. Well, if you follow David Jeremiah, you know that's not something he would say. And I said, no, I don't believe that's true. And then he showed me the video. So I went online to David Jeremiah's website to contact us, and I said to them, I've heard the report that Jeremiah said he's found new proof the Lord is coming back in 2024. And it, did he say that? And they responded and said, no, these fraudulent videos are being circulated. They get lots of reports on them. So in this day and age, especially in this election year, it is, and when it has to do with religion, be very careful what you listen to and what you believe. Is it real? Is it not real? Almost everything changes. Almost everything changes. Hebrews 1.10, You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain, and they will grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up, and they will be changed, but you are the same, and your years fail not. We can't ever forget that. Malachi 3, 6, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Only God has the attribute of unchangeableness. Nothing else in creation does. Only God has the attribute of unchangeableness. That's called the immutability of God. He does not change. Everything else does. Which brings us to, day, to today's scripture. Hebrews 13, 8, it says this, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Pray with me for me. Lord God, you have assembled us here in this place today for your purposes. 
Fathers, we reflect on and we speak about the Lord Jesus. Impress on our minds who he is, even today. Impress on our hearts what he has done for us. And Father, as later in the service we celebrate the Lord's Supper, help us truly to examine ourselves to see if we are in fellowship with you. Hide anything that hinders our relationship with you. Let us confess it. And Father, help us, I pray, to have pure hearts as we come to you this morning. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at this verse. It's a very short verse. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let's look at it, uh, the words. And let's look at Jesus. Jesus, Yeshua, Yeshua, Yahweh saves. Jesus, salvation, Savior. That's who he is. Gabriel said to Mary there in Luke, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus, Yeshua. Yahweh saves, and he will save his people from their sin. You know, Jesus, God in the flesh. I can't imagine having a faith in a church where Jesus is not divine. I can't imagine that. What do people do? God in the flesh. The most extraordinary, the most mysterious, the most wonderful thing that could ever happen to mankind. Think about that for a moment. God, who created everything, the entire expanse of all the universe and this little planet we inhabit, he created it all and he condescended, this transcendent God, all-powerful, omniscient, all-present, condescended to come to this earth, intersect time, and live in a human body for us, to know us, and to reveal himself to us. It was an amazing thing. Listen to this, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 4. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers, by his prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels. When we talk about Jesus, that's who we're talking about. Jesus, God in the flesh. Jesus, God, who created everything. And in him all things consist. And in him is always preeminence for the church. In Colossians 1.15, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things. In him all things consist, and he's the head of the body, the church. You should never forget, this church, Jesus is the head of the church. He has an under-shepherd here. And we are his believers, his followers, his disciples, but he is the head of the church, and in all things he may have preeminence. That's Jesus. We never take that name lightly. Jesus, Revelation 1.8 said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and was and who is to come, the Almighty. Don't let anybody confuse you about who the Lord Jesus is. He is God incarnate. Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. His appearance may change. He doesn't look at all now like he did when he walked this planet. His title may change. He is prophet, priest, and king. But the essence, his heart, his attitude, the things that make him God, his omnipotence, his power, his love, his compassion, never change. It never changes. It was true yesterday. It's true for us today, and it's true for every day in the future, right up into eternity. He will never change. 
One attribute he has is immutability, unchangeableness. Jesus Christ. Christ, and you've heard this said many times, is not his last name. Jesus Christ. Jesus the Christ. Christ is his title. He is the anointed one, the Messiah, the one chosen by God to come and through his suffering on the cross to bring salvation to humanity. He is the Christ. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5 says this, speaking about, remember, this is written 700 years before Christ was even born. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed, we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. He is the Christ, the Messiah, who brought all that to bear and suffered on the cross for us, for you and me. John the Baptist said in John 1.29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's who the Lord Jesus is. Jesus Christ, I, it just puts me on edge when I hear people use that name as a swear name or a, in some way that dishonors God. It comes out so naturally without thinking Jesus is God, God in the flesh. Jesus is the Savior. He is the Christ. We need to pay honor to that, that name. Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. In the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 11, list many of the really strong testimonies of faith in the Old Testament. It, we, sometimes it's called the Hall of Faith or the, the Hall of Fame for Faith, those sorts of things. And among those that are talked about is Abraham, who believed God and was accounted for him for righteousness, and Sarah, remember, who was barren, and in faith she conceived and bore Isaac, her son, uh, and then he wrote about how God was faithful to people like Moses, who brought people out of Egypt and led them through the wilderness. And Jacob, the father of the 12 tribes of Israel, he was, he was faithful to Gideon, the warrior, and Rahab, the harlot, faithful to all these people. But the point he made, these people all died in faith. They fa had faith in God. And God, the same thing God they believed in, is the same God today for us. And he said in that chapter 12, we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Not that they're watching us, but they have a testimony of faith that we can learn from. We can be inspired by their faith to live in faith toward God because generations come and go. These people have all passed away. The first century church disciples, the apostles have all passed away. But from generation to generation to generation, Jesus Christ is the same. He's the same to you and me as he was to Moses. He's the same to you and me as he was to James and John and Peter and the other apostles. He's always there. He's always there. He does not change. He never changes. When he said the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, Yesterday could be the Old Testament times when the, or the first century Christians. Um, it could be all the way back to eternity past if you want to go that way. But in the context of Hebrews, it means for those Christians, those believers, those, those people who had faith in God in the Old Testament, God was the same as he is for us, for us today. And I asked myself, what was this man Jesus like? like when he walked here on this earth. He walked on that land in Israel. Lon Solomon called it the land of honey, milk and honey and rocks. He walked on that land which he created. He breathed the air which he created. What was there about him that should make us rejoice in the knowledge that he is the same today as he was yesterday? I was thinking just a couple of things that come to mind in my, in my mind. Jesus was a person of love and compassion. You cannot think about him and his ministry without seeing love and compassion with other people. He cared for people. And that's a critical thing for us to know, especially 
in David's prayer this morning, you talked about the world that's coming unglued in some places and, uh, you know, up is down and down is up and right is wrong and wrong is right, those sorts of things. Jesus doesn't change. He loves people and he has compassion on them. Just leafing through Mar uh, Matthew and Luke, I found several things. In Matthew 8, 12, Jesus cleansed the leper. It says the leper came out of the mountain. He'd probably been in exile because people don't hang around with people with skin disease, leprosy. Uh, they're in exile. They're, you can't go near them. But he came to Jesus and he said to him, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus touched him and said to him, be cleansed. That was the Jesus we know, who hears and is, he, can, he receives people with problems, he receives people with pain, and he deals with them. In Matthew 8.13, he healed a centurion servant, a Roman soldier no less, came to Jesus, believed who he was, I think, and said to him, my servant is paralyzed and suffering, but if you will say the word, he'll be cured. And Jesus said, well, let's go and see him. And he said, no. The soldier said, I'm a man of authority. And I say to people, go, and they go, and come, and they come. If you just say the word, my servant will be healed. And Jesus said, I have not seen such faith in all of Israel. And he said to the soldier, go your way. It is as you believe. That's Jesus. He, has, he takes time to get involved with people's lives. In Matthew 9, 24, father came to Jesus desperate and said, Master, my daughter is sick and dying. Please come and help me. On the way, he ran into a lady with an issue of blood, if you remember that story, and stopped and dealt with her, healed her, and then went to the, the man's house. And in the house, people were weeping and wailing and crying. And they said, what's wrong? He said, my daughter has died. And Jesus said, take me to her. He said, she's sleeping. She isn't dead. And they ridiculed him because she had died. So he took her hand and said, all right. And the girl got up. And then he said, give her something to eat. That's, he, that's who Jesus was. He loves people. He has compassion on people. He made a, a mute man speak. That's who he is. He can do that today. We don't see a lot of those miracles. Jesus needed to do these miracles to validate what he said. We don't see a lot of them today, but remember what Jesus said? If you believe in me and follow me, greater things than these. You will do. And because of that, the gospel of Jesus Christ has spread all around the world. In 30 years after his death, that went all around North Africa, up the Mediterranean, all the way over to Italy. It's amazing how it grew, and it continues to grow. Jesus felt the sorrow other people felt. When his friend Lazarus died, Jesus went with them to the tomb, and Mary was weeping, was sad and mourning, and Jesus identified with her sorrow and John 11, 35 said, Jesus wept. That's who he was. He wept for people. Jesus looked at Jerusalem and understood that they were blind to the fact, to the truth of what would give them real peace. And he wept over the city. He, was, he felt pity for them, sadness for them. And he still moved with people today. He still, he still loves people and helps people. If you have an issue... Take it to God in prayer. And let him deal with it in your life. It may not come about exactly the way you want the answer, but to answer a prayer means he heeds it, he pays attention to it. And in his time and his will, it will bring that prayer answer to, to pass. And pray to Jesus. Jesus, same today as he was then, loves you. He gave out an invitation then. He said this, Come unto me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. How many of us would like to find rest from this world and turmoil sometimes? Come unto me, 
and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. The invitation went out to everyone who heard him yesterday. The invitation goes out to all those readers who are reading this letter for the first time yesterday. The invitation goes out through all the church age to us, even today. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's an invitation. Knows no national boundaries, no language barriers, no ethnic barriers. It goes out to everyone, all nations. Are you looking for peace? That's a hard one. Peace in the midst of the storm. Everybody has a storm to go through from time to time. Someone said, if Jesus is in the boat with you, the boat won't sink and the storm won't last forever. If Jesus is with you in your storm, it may be a personal storm. It may be a family storm. It may be a storm, a question of faith, a doubt, a doubting storm. It may be health-related, maybe financially related, whatever your storm is. Jesus offers peace in the storm. Jesus said in John 16, 33, these things I have spoken to you that you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And his peace is not just an absence of conflict. His peace is being reconciled to God. There's no more hostility between you and God. You know who God is. God has come to you. God has revealed himself to you through Jesus Christ. You've been saved. You've been born again. You're in the family of God. You never have to worry about the wrath of God. And you never have to worry about being alone. Jesus said to the disciples in John 14, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. There are lots of ways to find peace. Paul writes in uh, Philippians 4, 6, this is the recipe, I, I think, in my mind, and perhaps for you to find peace in whatever you're living through at the moment. Paul said this, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. There is never a point where you say it's hopeless. There's no hope. I give up. Pray. Go to the Lord. And he will guard your heart and mind and bring peace to your soul and to your spirit. Jesus loved people. He had compassion on people. But I think most importantly for me and perhaps for you, this God-man Jesus could forgive sin. And you see that through the scripture. He loved people. He didn't want them to suffer the penalty of sin, which is God's judgment and wrath. He said to the woman who was brought to him in adultery, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Jesus didn't come to condemn. He came to save. He came to help. He came to bring life, abundant life. Jesus said to the sinful woman who washed his feet, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This woman who washed his feet was known as a sinner of terrible sins, I suppose. But he loved her. We have a friend who has the feeling that she was, did so many things that were bad in her life that God can't love her. God cannot forgive her. And I think that's very sad because the scriptures are very clear. If you confess those sins... Jesus is just and fair to forgive you of those sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He does not want us to live in our past. He does not want us to bring up those sins anymore. That's past. That's forgiven. They're put away from us as far as east is from the west. 
God chooses for us to live this life to his glory, not to be sorrow in sin, but rejoice in the Savior and what's coming. Someday Jesus is coming back, and we need to be ready for that. We need to be joyful people. That's what he wants us to do. That's why he forgives sins. That's why he gives us peace. Jesus was a man that people followed. He was a man's man, I think. Charismatic, great multitudes came to him, and for various reasons, whether they saw a miracle or, or got food or something, but he attracted people to him. And people liked him, some of his teaching they didn't like, but when he said that he forgave sins, this is when the religious leaders really got riled up with him. They say, no, 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 you can't do that. And in, this, uh, in Mark 2, this account is so rich, you should go back and read it sometime. Jesus set up a, a situation where the scribes could, th these are people who are expert in the law, could reason for themselves and figure out that, oh, he can forgive sins. That's what should have happened. Let me read this to you. You remember the account of the, the man who was paralyzed on a litter of some kind and his four friends brought him to Jesus and the house was so crowded he couldn't get in. So they went up the outside stairs and went to the roof and made a hole in the tile or whatever it was and lowered the man down into the room where Jesus was so he could see him. And this is Mark chapter 2, beginning at verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, the faith of the men, the friends who brought him, and the paralytic man, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. And some of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God? That was their question. But immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your heart? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk? I can see these scribes kind of scratching their head, which is easier. But that you may know that the Son of Man has the power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And the scripture says, immediately he arose, took up his bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that the people were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. The scribes and others did not see it that way after a miracle like this and after healing a withered hand on the Sabbath, you know what they did? They figured out, tried to figure out a way to kill this Jesus. Isn't that amazing? They wanted to kill him. We never saw anything like this. Jesus was a man of love and compassion and wisdom. All man and all God. As the unique Son of God, Jesus brought salvation to mankind in John's Gospel. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the Gospel, the Kingdom of God, saying, the time is fulfilled and the Kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the Gospel. Our wonderful Lord Jesus saved sinners. Remember Zacchaeus went up the tree? Said, Zacchaeus, you come down. He says, today salvation has come to this house. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. This Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, who loved so perfectly and had compassion for all people in need, people uh, in sorrow. He showed mercy to sinners when he walked on this earth. And he is the same today as he was then. 
and we'll be the same Jesus right into eternity where you and I will meet him one day. He doesn't come back. Uh, the death rate's about 100% for people. <clears throat> We're going to go meet him sometime, or he's going to come take us out. He does not change. He ascended into heaven, is at the right hand of God. He is our high priest interceding for us to the Father. Hebrews 7, 24 says this, Because Jesus continues forever, he has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. That's our message. That's the message of the gospel of Christ. He is interceding at the right hand of God for anybody who comes to him in faith. He is truth. He is faithful to his promises. He is God. He does not change. And because every believer, when they accept Christ and experience the new birth, he can say to them, because the Holy Spirit comes to indwell their lives, he can say to them, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He's sitting in this room with us. He may be sitting beside you in your pew. He may be listening, he may be saying, Randy, what are you talking about today? He's here. We're two or more gathered together in my name. I am there among them. He is here with us, and he does not change. Generations have come and gone. Nations have risen and fallen. Empires have been raised up, and they're gone. All forms of communication, technology, everything has brought changes to our lives. Through all this change, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He never changes. He never changes. He is our rock. Truly, he is our foundation. The Proverbs writer says, when the whirlwind comes, the wicked will disappear. But the righteous have an everlasting foundation. And that is on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our fortress. The answer for every message about Jesus is this. For every person, do you know Jesus as your Savior? Is Jesus my Savior? We ask that ourselves a lot. When you think about the Scripture and what it takes to be saved, repentance and faith in Christ, are you saved? Do you want to know this wonderful Savior? And I look at this group and I'm thinking, everybody here has probably made a profession of faith in Christ. I know Aliyah was baptized. Yes. And I think Mr. Belter is going to be baptized soon. Yeah. Jesus said, repent and believe. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart. God raised him from the dead. You shall be saved. You can save that. You can share that news with anybody you come into. Anyone you run into. That's a simple message. God loved the world. Some of you may have drifted some distance away from the Lord Jesus and maybe not living in a way exactly representing him or bringing honor to him. This is a good time to consider that and say in your mind, in your heart, Lord, I want to follow you more closely. I want to know you better. I want to love you more. I want to do that. But all of us here in this place this morning have a responsibility to Jesus to pray for this church and to pray for the pastor search committee and to begin praying for that person God has selected to come here and minister to you. He's a wonderful God and he's faithful. He is worthy of our worship and he's worthy of our praise. Would you pray with me? Lord God, you are an awesome God. Jesus, you are our Savior, our Christ. You are the Lord of our lives. Help each one of us in room, this room this morning to get another glimpse of you as God and the one who created everything, but the one who loves us and knows us and will come to us in our need, will come to us when we sorrow and help us, will come to us when we rejoice and rejoice with us, will come to us and teach us the right way. 
Lord God, Jesus, lead us in that path that you would have us to take. Bless this congregation as they pray and search for a pastor to lead this flock. Watch over them, care for them, meet their needs, minister to them, and help them to be faithful in all things, I pray in Jesus' name. We're going to do a song of invitation, one verse. I may have gone over some, Luke. I'm sorry about that. Okay. I don't know. Uh, I'm sorry about that. It, it's pushing 12 o'clock. So um, we have communion. So, yes. Um, if anyone would like, uh, let's do a, a verse of that song, the invitation. Oh, okay. We're not going to do that. Okay. Well, let's do let's do the communion. This is one of the most wonderful ordinances of the church. Uh, I love it. It would be nice. I think I've said this before in this place. If if all the world, all the believers in Christ, could have sit down together, or at least at the same time, and celebrate the Lord's Supper, what a blessing that would be. You know, it would be an awesome blessing. And I'm not sure what to do with this. <laughs> <laughs> Put that in your towel. Okay. Then you're out. Okay. <sighs> I'm old fashioned. I love 1 Corinthians 11 for the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> Jesus um, invited his disciples, you know, at this Passover dinner. Uh, it's a fellowship dinner, and it's a fellowship here. It ought to be a fellowship. Paul was very careful and said to people, uh, examine yourselves before you take the elements, the bread and the juice. Before you take the elements, examine yourself to see that there's nothing hindering your worship. There's nothing standing between you and the fellowship with God. And um, it's an amazing thing. Jesus is worthy of all our worship and all our praise. And he gave us this, um, it's like an object lesson to use to remember him. And we do this in this church every month, the first Sunday of every month. We never take it for granted. We always pray over it, and we always take it as a, a holy time. 1 Corinthians 11.25, Paul writes this, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and we had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, I remember when I was here, I called on people to pray for the bread. Is it all right if I do that this morning? Yep. David, would you pray for the bread, over the bread? Thank okay. the Lord for his body. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to your table, remember the great sacrifice of your Son and this bread that represents the body that was broken for us for, our, for, for us, for our sins, not for your sins. And we just ask a blessing on our time now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, David.
Jesus our Lord said, this is my body, which is given for you. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. Thank you, Lord. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We pray a, a prayer of thankfulness for the blood of Christ that saves us from our sin. Brother Lee, would you pray that prayer? Father, we thank you for the sacrifice of your son. Uh, we thank you that Jesus voluntarily gave up its life and uh, underwent suffering, uh, the, the stripes and the bruises and the wounding that he went. Uh, we know that by his stripes we are healed. You, uh, though we were scarlet, we are made white as snow. And so we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lee. Lord Jesus took these simple elements to help us remember what he did for us. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me, he said. And in scriptures it said when they sang a hymn, they went out. If you would stand, <clears throat> and blessed be the tie that binds. What an awesome song. today. Uh, we thank you uh, for the opportunity to come and worship you in spirit and truth. Uh, we ask a blessing on Randy and Sandy as, as they go home. We ask a blessing for each person represented here and their families that we may go out and share the good news of your gospel this week. Until we meet again, uh, keep us in the palm of your hand. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Good to see 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 you.